Hi everybody, welcome to part two and the final part of my seismic hazard analysis lecture. And in, in the previous part, you'll recall that we reviewed deterministic seismic ha uh, hazard analysis. We introduced the idea of probabilistic seismic hazard analysis and then we did some basic review of some probability concepts including the total probability theorem. And we gave a nice example with baseball. And then we talked about the first uncertainty that is accounted for by probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, which is spatial uncertainty. So now I'm going to fast forward here and we're going to pick up where we left off. And we're going to talk about uh, uncertainty dealing with how big will the earthquake be. So really this is uncertainty dealing with the magnitude. Now when we talk about the uncertainty dealing with magnitude, this is uh, handled with what we call recurrence laws. When we say recurrence, we think, well, how often will something um, repeat itself or occur again and again? And what we're talking about uh, with that re repetition uh, is earthquake magnitude. How often will an earthquake magnitude repeat itself or in a given year, what is the likelihood of experiencing or exceeding a given earthquake magnitude? So there are three general types of recurrence laws that we um, commonly use. I mean, there's lots of others, uh, believe me. But these are the three basic types that we commonly see in PSHA. The first is slip dependent laws. So these are recurrence laws that are governed by um, regularity in the slip of the fault. So um, how much it tends to slip. And if it locks up for a given amount of time, then we predict how much is going to slip given how much time has passed since the last slip. The second are what we call Gutenberg-Richter laws. And the third are what we call characteristic earthquake laws. So let's talk first a little bit about um, some terminology with recurrence uh, laws. The first is uh, what we call the annual rate of exceedance. So this is defined basically as the number of earthquakes larger than a specified magnitude that occurs each year on average. So for example, say I give um, a magnitude 7.0 as my earthquake of interest, I want to know on average what is the number of earthquakes that exceed a magnitude 7.0 on a given fault. That would be its annual rate of exceedance. Then uh, the next thing I want to introduce is what we call the return period. The return period is the number of years on average before an earthquake larger than a specified magnitude occurs. So um, the return period is nothing more really than the reciprocal of the uh, mean annual rate of exceedance. So the two are, are related in this fashion. Between these two, by the way, um, return period is the term that we're often more comfortable or familiar with. We use return periods a lot when we talk about floods. Like, what's the 20-year flood or what's the 50-year flood? Those 20 years or the 50 years, those are return periods. So we may say, what's the return period of exceeding a magnitude uh, 7.0 earthquake? Or what's the return period of earthquake greater than 8.0? Um, it, it's the same concept, just a different hazard. So let's talk just a little bit about slip dependent recurrence laws. Um, these are typically assigned to faults that are known to have um, an approximate annual average slip rate. So um, there are certain faults that have shown a, a tremendous amount of regularity in the slip that they produce. And, and so we can predict how much slip is going to occur given a certain amount of time that passes. And given um, the amount of slip, using equations like Wells and Coppersmith, we can correlate that to a given magnitude. And so we come up then with plots that look like this, for instance, where um, for a fault that demonstrates maybe a certain amount of slip per year, maybe we want to know, okay, if I have a fault that 
that slips on average, say, one centimeter per year, what's the annual uh, or what's the return period I could expect for a magnitude 7.0 earthquake? Well, then I would say, you know, the return period is approximately, uh, you know, what is that? Uh, 10 to the second. So that's almost, what, 200 years, uh, maybe 150 years uh, between a magnet, uh, for a magnitude 7.0. And, and so, you know, these, these charts are nice and handy. The problem is that um, there are really very few faults that fall into this category. And so uh, we don't use this type of recurrence law very often, maybe just with a, a couple of faults that have shown this tremendous regularity. More common is a Gutenberg-Richter recurrence law. And, and these have been around for a while, since like the 1930s or so, but um, they're still very widely used. And um, it's, it's actually one of the most amazing earthquake or seismic related discoveries. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons why you know Gutenberg and Richter are still such big names in earthquake engineering. These um, relationships essentially state the number of earthquakes occurring annually or each year from a given source is a log linear function of the magnitude. Uh, so what do I mean by this? Well, um, let's say, uh, for instance, I collect data from a certain seismic source. And so I have, you know, different magnitude say magnitude five six seven eight nine <laughs> so I guess I don't need that one okay and let's say that in um, over here I have mean annual rate of exceedance for magnitude so let's say that um, since 1930 or something I count up the number of earthquakes that occurred um, that were greater than a magnitude five and then I divide that number by the number of years it's passed. So what would that be? Since 1930, say, that would be uh, 70, 80, 80, um, 87 years or so. Okay. So I take that number that has occurred that have been greater than five, and I divide it by the number of years that have passed. So um, that's going to give me my mean annual rate of exceedance. And I, for whatever that is, I'm going to plot it, okay? And then for magnitude 6.0 earthquakes, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to compute the, I'm going to count the number of earthquakes that exceeded a magnitude 6.0 in that time frame, divide it by that time frame, and I get the mean annual rate of exceedance. Same thing for 7.0, 8.0, 9.0. And what we approximately get is about a straight line. That's not a very good straight line. Yeah, now we're talking. Okay, so I'm just trying to fit a function or something. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we get an approximate straight line with this data. What's the power now of this data? Well, this means that it, basically what it's stating is that every single seismic source or seismic region tends to follow the same pattern or trend. And once we know that line or can approximate that line, we can describe it with its slope, which we call the B parameter. And then um, we can describe its intercept with um, what we call the A parameter. Now, um, what they showed was actually if we, we have to plot this thing on a logarithmic scale to make it go linear. So if we plot the log, of the mean annual rate of exceedance. Uh, that means that this should have been the log. I, I apologize. Uh, because a logarithmic plot never actually um, reaches the axis, what we want to do is find out where this line crosses what would be a magnitude zero event. And that point where it crosses it we say is equal 10 to the A, whatever that point is, okay? So with these terms, uh, these A and these B parameters then, we can predict what the 
mean annual rate of exceedance is for any given magnitude of interest. Sometimes we call these Gutenberg-Richter models um, time-dependent models, but they're more commonly called Gutenberg-Richters. So we can describe then this recurrence relationship using this equation between A and B, or if we just solve uh, linearly for the mean annual rate of exceedance, then it's going to look something like this. Now remember, M is the moment magnitude of interest. If we want to write things in terms of natural log, then we can convert A to alpha, where alpha is 2.303 times A, and beta is 2.303 times B. And it's just because we're using um, the, the exponential function instead of the, um, the, the tenth power. So there were some problems, though, um, with the Gutenberg-Richter relationship that led to the development of what we call the bounded Gutenberg-Richter recurrence laws. And, and they've been developed to account for both a minimum and a maximum magnitude. And why do we need a minimum and a maximum magnitude? Well, uh, we may need a, a minimum magnitude because as engineers, we only care about earthquake magnitudes that are going to cause damage. And typically earthquakes are going to start causing damage when we get to magnitudes greater than four or five. So I don't, really don't care about earthquakes of magnitude three or earthquakes of magnitude two. I, they're, they're really not of interest to me, so I'm just going to remove them from my calculations. And why do I need a maximum magnitude? Well, because if I go back and look at this plot, for instance, this line is going to extend all the way down, 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 down. And it's going to keep going, like to even to you know magnitude 9.5. But isn't it interesting that if you look at this line, where's the data points down there? Do you see any data for the circumpacific belt or the faults on the circumpacific belt? Nope, I don't see any data. And so that implies that certain faults are just not capable of producing a, a certain number of magnitude. You know, like for instance, the Wasatch Fault in Utah it's never going to produce a magnitude 9.0. It's just not physically capable. We need like a mega thrust subduction zone source to produce a magnitude 9.0. So we know that certain seismic sources just physically can't produce earthquakes above a certain magnitude. And if we just use a straight line Gutenberg-Richter law, then we're going to start predicting likelihoods for magnitudes that physically just can't happen. So we're going to assign a maximum magnitude. And so that's going to vary depending on what source we're looking at. So um, when I want to know a maximum magnitude, this is usually what we're computing with equations like the Wells and Coppersmith equation. So you're going to compute Wells and Coppersmith and you're going to go to like the 84th or the 95th percentile for magnitude on the Wells and Coppersmith. And that's what we're going to call maximum magnitude. Then we're going to adjust our um, Gutenberg-Richter recurrence equation using the minimum magnitude and the maximum magnitude. And so if we're using um, beta terms, for instance, um, then we can plug our values in like this. So now, remember, we're not using log. We're using exponential and natural logs. So I have alpha and beta. What you remember, alpha is 2.303 um, times A, and beta is 2.303 times B. Um, and this term here, this new, is what we call the, um, whoops, is what we call the uh, mean annual rate of exceedance for the um, minimum magnitude event. So it has its own special variable that we call nu. So this is the mean annual rate of exceeding the minimum earthquake magnitude shown right there. 
So the nice thing about these now, um, if you look at this plot on the right, here's the mean annual rate of exceedance. But now instead of the line coming straight down like that, look what happens. If my maximum earthquake magnitude is a 6.0, notice how the line dives and comes down and goes vertical at a magnitude 6.0. And it will never be bigger than its maximum magnitude. Or notice how this line, if my maximum magnitude is 7.0, it dives down and will never be larger than a 7.0. So that's the value then of these um, bounded Gutenberg-Richter recurrence laws. If I want to plot the probability that a magnet, my magnitude equals some magnitude of interest, then I can compute that with this probability density function here. So that equation is the probability that my magnitude equals some magnitude of interest given a minimum magnitude and a maximum magnitude. And of course, my um, B value for my plot. If I want the cumulative density function, so that would be the probability that my magnitude is less than some magnitude of interest, I want to use this equation right here. So this, uh, given my magnitude of interest, my minimum magnitude, and my maximum magnitude. So let's look at an example problem, how we might account for these probabilities. Let's say that I have a given fault. And for that fault, my A value from the Gutenberg-Richter relationship is 4.4, and my B value is 0 0.8. So remember, we get those from those linear plots of earth uh, magnitude recurrence from a, a particular region or, or fault. Let's say that as the engineer, I'm only worried about magnitudes uh, equal to or greater than 4.0. And for this particular fault, I use a Wells-Coppersmith relationship at, this, I don't know, the 84th percentile. So I compute a maximum magnitude of 8.0. Let's say that I want to compute the mean annual probability that an earthquake between a magnitude 6.0 and a magnitude 7.0 will occur. Okay, so first of all, let's compute my alpha value. So that's just 2.303 times A. Um, and I plug A in here as 4.4. So I get 10.133 for my alpha value. Let's compute my beta value. It's the same calculation, but I'm going to throw a B in right there. And I get 1.842 for beta. Okay, so if I want the probability that um, my magnitude is between 6 and 7, let's try to, to envision what this is going to look like. Okay, so here I am. I have my probability density function, and I have magnitude. going to look something like this. Now let's say that um, here's my magnitude, you know, 4.0. Here's magnitude 6.0. And let's say here's magnitude 7.0. So maybe that's magnitude 5.0. Okay. What I want is the probability that uh, I have between a magnitude 7 and a magnitude 6. So I want this area of the curve. So how am I going to get it? Well, the first thing I'm going to do, let's get this really big. I'm going to compute the probability that I am less than a magnitude 7.0. And then I'm going to subtract from that the probability that I am less than a 6.0. So all that's going to go away, and all that I'm left with then is this probability right here. Which is the probability I was interested in in the first place. 
So we need to use our probability density functions for the bounded Gutenberg-Richter relationship. So the probability that the magnitude is less than 7.0, here it is. This is my cumulative density function for my bounded Gutenberg-Richter relationship for a magnitude 7.0 earthquake given a minimum magnitude of 4.0 and a maximum magnitude of 8.0. And that's going to give me 0 0.997. So obviously, you know, my little sketch was a little bit off. So I'm way over to the right-hand portion of my bell curve. 0.997 or 99.7% of my bell curve is less than a magnitude 7.0. Okay, then the probability that my magnitude is less than 6.0. Same equation, but at just different numbers. I'm putting in my magnitude of 6 my minimum magnitude of 4.0 and my maximum magnitude of 8.0. So I get 0.975. So I need to subtract this probability from this probability to get the probability that I'm between a magnitude 6 and a 7. So that's what this equation tells me to do. So I just plug in my probabilities, subtract the difference, and I get 0 0.022 or 2.2 percent probability uh, that my mean annual rate of exceedance is between a 6 and a 7. What does that mean? That means that on any given year the probability that I will experience a, an earthquake between a magnitude 6 and a magnitude 7 on that fault is 2.2 percent for any given year. Okay, the last recurrence law I want to talk about is the characteristic earthquake recurrence law. And this is a, a powerful and a, and a really cool recurrence law because um, it, it ties back to our current and modern understanding of how faults work. So in, in the 1980s, uh, paleo seismologists began to study earthquake faults and, and fault rupture. And what they noticed is that many faults seem to have what they called or termed a characteristic earthquake. So a characteristic earthquake means that when the fault ruptures, that it um, tends to rupture with the same magnitude event over and over and over again. And, and why is this significant? Well, because if, again, I'm looking at, oh, that's too big. Let's shrink that down. If I'm looking at the mean annual rate of exceeding a given magnitude versus magnitude, and I have my, oh, the log of, excuse me. So I have, um, my 10 raised to the A, and this is slope B. Okay, what this is implying is that, say I have earthquakes up here of really, really low magnitude, and earthquakes down here of really, really high magnitude. What this is saying is that there's a high likelihood that I'm going to experience earthquakes of a low magnitude on a particular fault. and that there's a very low annual likelihood that I'm going to experience earthquakes of a very large magnitude. So say this was like three and say this is like seven. Um, so there's a low likelihood, an annual likelihood that I'm going to exceed magnitudes greater than say seven. That's what Gutenberg-Richter is, is telling me. But what we observed, if we look at actual data, is that there tends to be kind of a gap. So what we tend to see is that the seismicity data says, yeah, we have recorded earthquakes that tend to follow kind of this Gutenberg-Richter pattern, but they, they kind of drop off at low magnitude events. In other words, um, we don't see a huge rep repeated number of these really, really small magnitude events. And the reason we don't is because the faults lock up on the asperities. In order to have really small events, that means the faults have to be rupturing all the time, but they're not. They're locked up on the asperities. So we have a, a small number 
of um, low magnitude faults. And then instead of having, you know, data down here, instead of having that data, we have a gap. And then we have a whole lot of points that correspond to a maximum magnitude. So in other words, what these paleoseismologists noted is that there tends to be the big characteristic earthquake time and time and time again on these faults, but we don't have magnitudes in between. We kind of have moderate magnitudes from time to time. We have a, a, you know, a few really small magnitudes, and then we have the big characteristic earthquake, but we have a gap. We don't have data in between. And so if we want to account for that, we have this kind of hybrid recurrence law where um, on the left side of this gap, we have data that's explained by a Gutenberg-Richter relationship. And then to the right of that gap, we have data that's explained by the characteristic earthquake. So in other words, the small earthquakes are still linearly distributed from the Gutenberg-Richter relationship, just not the big ones. Okay, so um, that wraps up talking about how we account for uncertainty in how big an earthquake will be. We use recurrence laws. Now, let's talk about the third source of uncertainty. Even if I knew what the magnitude was, and even if I knew where the earthquake occurred, I still don't know how big my ground motion will be at my actual site. And that again relates to this idea that even with recorded ground motions, there's a lot of scatter and uncertainty. So, you know, at this point we can just throw darts and guess and, and blindly pick a level of certainty like the 84th percentile or the 50th percentile that, that we want to apply in computing our earthquake ground motions like, like we would in a deterministic analysis. Probabilistic methods let us account for all the possible ground motions and weight them accordingly to their likelihoods of being exceeded. So let's, let's show you an example. Um, for simplicity, let's just use a simple attenuation relationship. And let's say that this relationship gives us the natural log of the spectral acceleration um, and so at a period of zero seconds, that's, so that's going to give us the PGA, the mean computed spectral acceleration, or, or the PGA, from one of the seismic sources we're evaluating is 0 0.162 G. Let's assume that from this attenuation relationship, from the scatter in the data, that the log normal standard deviation is equal to 0 0.39. Okay, I'm just making these numbers up, but let's assume that that's what the model gives us. Okay, I want to find the probability that my actual spectral acceleration at my site will exceed 0 0.25 G. So the median, what the line gave me, the best estimate was 0.162 G but I want to know the probability of exceeding 0.25 G. So here we go. So my mean value is the natural log of the spectral acceleration, and that's the natural log of 0.162 G. So that gives me negative 1.82. The value of interest is the natural log of 0 0.25 G, and so that gives me negative 1.386. So I want to compute the Z value associated with these. So um, I'm going to put in my value of interest minus my mean divided by my log normal standard deviation. So I get 1.1128. So then I'm going to take this value and I'm going to plug it into a CDF. 
But it's not just any CDF, right? Because a CDF gives me the probability of non-exceedance, and I want the probability of exceedance. So I've got to do 1 minus the cumulative distribution or cumulative density function. So I'm going to throw that z value of 1.1128 into my standard um, cumulative distribution function. And that gives me um, 0.8671. So 1 minus 0 0.8671. And that gives me 0.1329 or 13.29%. What does this mean? That the probability uh, given these ground motions and this uh, attenuation relationship, the probability that my actual ground motion at my site exceeds 0.25 g is 13. Oh, that was kind of weird. Is 13.29 percent. That's a pretty high probability. Okay, so. This example, we computed the probability that the PGA exceeds 0.25 g. But wait, you know, the mean acceleration of, of, of PGA equals 0.162 g was computed with a single pair of magnitude and distance values. I mean, one scenario earthquake. What about the spatial uncertainty? and the recurrence laws accounting for the uncertainty in earthquake magnitude. And, and how do we account for that? You know, it becomes basically just a big an accounting exercise trying to keep track of all these different scenarios. So this is where our total probability theorem is going to come into play. As long as we track our individual conditional probabilities associated with the spatial variability and the magnitude uh, recurrence laws and the ground motion exceedance probabilities, we can find the overall probability of exceeding a given ground motion. So what are we going to do? First of all, we need to compute the probability of exceeding 0.25 g for every possible combination of magnitude and distance. Then we need to multiply <coughs> that probability of exceedance by the probability of having those values of magnitude and distance. And then we're going to sum all those probabilities together. So this is where we get this big equation right here. This is the probability that my spectral acceleration will exceed 0.25 g given my magnitude equals this m sub j and my distance equals r sub k times the probability that my magnitude equals mj and my distance equals rk and then we're going to iterate through every possible combination of magnitude and distance and sum all those probabilities up now once we get that probability after we iterate through those loops if we multiply that summation by the mean annual rate of exceeding our minimum, our minimum magnitude, remember we called that nu. That's the same thing as this uh, mean annual rate of exceeding m min. We get the mean annual rate of exceeding 0 0.25 g. Now, now think about that. In, in, we went from What's the likelihood of magnitudes? What's the likelihood of distances from my site? And now we've computed what the mean annual rate or likelihood is of getting a ground motion, a PGA greater than 0.25 g at my site. That's powerful. And so the equation is going to look like this. So I know what you're thinking, like, uh, Dr. Frankie, I'm, I'm done. This is too scary. These equations are, 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 are we done yet? No, of course not. There's more. What if there are more than just one seismic source? Remember, this equation here is only for one seismic source, like one fault. So what if I have multiple faults around my site? 
then I got to account for those two. We're going to repeat this process for every possible seismic source. And for each of those sources, we're going to iterate through every possible combination of magnitude and distance for that site and compute the probabilities of exceeding 0.25 G. So it's going to look something like this. Where now this integral or this um, iteration right here is uh, represents the number of seismic sources. Okay, now are we done? Please, please, I can't take any more. Yeah, I know. No, of course not. The best part is still coming, guys. Most engineers aren't interested in just a peak acceleration of 0.25 g. Remember, this example, we're only looking at this one acceleration of interest. But say we want to know the mean annual rate of exceeding 0.3 g, or 0.35 g, or 0.4 g, or, or any peak ground acceleration value. We'll call it Y star. Well, if that's the case, then I can just write a generalized equation. The probability uh, or the mean annual rate of exceeding any ground motion value of interest, Y star, can be represented with this equation right here. So all that means is I can use this equation and solve for any acceleration value of interest. And then I can iterate or change that value of interest and resolve the equation again. So what would happen if you computed a wide range of mean annual rates of exceedances for different values of PGA and then you plotted <coughs> those values against the corresponding accelerations? If that's the case, you would develop what we call a seismic hazard curve for your site. What's a seismic hazard curve? Well, it's a function that relates mean annual rate of exceedance versus Y star or the um, ground motion of interest. What this means is that for your given site, say for instance, I want to know the probability of exceeding 0.29 or 0.3 G. The mean annual rate in any given year of exceeding 0.3 G of ground motion at my site is given right there. And that's from all seismic uh, source zones. What if I'm interested in just looking at the contributions from, say, fault number one? I can do that. Or what if I'm interested in fault number two or fault number three? Uh, that's the value of this probabilistic seismic hazard analysis is I can compute the, the contribution to the probability from each of my seismic sources. Um, and recall that if, if I don't want things in terms of a mean annual rate of exceedance, I can express them instead as a return period. So I can say um, the return period of a ground motion exceeding 0.3 g at my site is you know, 1 over lambda, whatever that lambda is. So in a PSHA, the, the seismic hazard curves computed for each source so, you know, source one, source two, source three are summed to give the total seismic hazard curve. So it's a combined aggregated representation of the seismic hazard from all of the seismic sources impacting your site all at once, not just one value at, or one source at a time. So let's talk about then the final source of earthquake uncertainty and how a seismic hazard curve contributes to that. So uh, that final source of uncertainty with a future earthquake is, well, when? When will the earthquake occur? So we call this source of uncertainty temporal uncertainty. So it's the uncertainty associated with when an earthquake of a given size or a given um, return period will occur. Uh, because earthquakes tend to occur pretty infrequently relative to the lifetime of our structure, so typically a structure is designed for a 50-year lifespan, most earthquakes occur on the order of hundreds if not thousands of years. So if that's the case, we can treat them as random 
and independent processes, independent relative to one another. And so if that's the case, then we can apply what's called the Poisson probability model. And this is the same model that applies to rolling the dice. What do I mean by this? Well, imagine if I was a gambler and I go into the casino every single day and I take one roll and only one roll of the dice. If I roll the dice and I lose on any given day and I leave, and then I come back the next day and I pick up the dice and I roll it again, does what I rolled in the previous day have any impact on what I'm going to roll the next day? And the answer is, of course, no. Every single day is a new roll and it has the same likelihood that I'm going to win or that I'm going to lose. And that's how we treat earthquakes. Every single day is a new day. And it doesn't matter whether an earthquake occurred yesterday, <coughs> 10 years ago, <coughs> 50 years ago, or 100 years ago. That's what the Poisson probability model tells us. <coughs> so if I want to use the Poisson probability model, I can relate that then that the probability that um, of exceeding some ground motion level of interest in a specified time frame t, say 50 years or 100 years, I could relate it using this equation right here. Where again this lambda y star is the mean annual rate of exceeding y star and we get that from our seismic hazard curve. And then of course t is the time frame of interest. So um, let's do an example. Let's say that we performed a PSHA and we developed a seismic hazard curve for a site. Then from that seismic hazard curve we find that lambda or the mean annual rate of exceedance associated with a PGA of 0.3 G is equal to 0.0013. So if I take the reciprocal of that, that would give me a return period of 770 years. Let's compute the probability that we would exceed that PGA of 0.3 G at the site within 50 years, in the next 50 years, okay? So I'm gonna use my Poisson probability distribution, where again, that value right there is my lambda, that value is my T. All I do is plug them in, folks, and I compute the value and I get 0.06 to almost 0 0.063 or 6.29 percent probability that I'm going to exceed 0.3 G's at my site in the next 50 years. Okay, so I know, I know a couple of you are sitting there going, wait, so you're telling me that the Poisson probability assumption does not account for the fact of when the last earthquake occurred. Well, hold on, what if the last earthquake occurred like 2,000 years ago? And the average earthquake happens every, say, 1,500 years on the fall. You mean to tell me that every single day is the same probability? That doesn't make sense. What about what we learned about seismic gaps and the elastic rebound theory? This doesn't add up. It, 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 it's not uh, making sense. <coughs> Well, you know, you can say, what do you think? Um, well, I think it doesn't make sense, and you're probably thinking the same thing. But several very smart seismologists have looked at this problem, evaluated the problem mathematically, and they've come up with some basic conclusions. Here's the, the gist of what they found out. The error in the um, use of the Poisson probability model is negligible in the majority of the cases. And the reason it's negligible, again, is because the lifetime of our structures, the design life of our structures, is very small relative to the average recurrence interval of the earthquakes we're talking about. But that's the only reason why the, the error is, is generally small. There are some cases where the Poisson probability model may not be a good idea. For instance, if our structure has an unusually long design life, like if we're designing, say, I don't know, Yucca Mountain nuclear waste storage containment, 
and it has a design life for 10,000 years. If that's the case, we're probably going to want to use a more advanced uh, temporal uncertainty model. Or if our previous seismicity shows a sh very strong time dependence between events. So we can rely on when the last earthquake occurred and we can have a strong um, confidence that we can predict approximately when the next earthquake is going to occur. And finally, if we have one or more of the significant seismic sources in our area, well overdue. So a good example of this is like Brigham City, uh, the Brigham City segment of the Wasatch Fault. This fault is about 1,000 years overdue for its rupture. Okay, folks, I know this is like drinking from a fire hose. And probabilistic seismic hazard analysis and deterministic seismic hazard analysis are big deals. They're very complex, okay? And a lot of people spend their entire careers researching and working with them. So don't feel overwhelmed or um, discouraged if you're not digesting and immediately understand everything that I talked about in this lecture and in the previous lecture. The homework assignment, homework number five, is going to help you um, get a feel for what a PSHA and a DSHA do and um, hopefully will answer some of the questions. I mean, sometimes the best way to learn is just to get in and get your hands dirty. So that's the end of this lecture, and I want to thank you for your attention, and I'll look forward to seeing you guys in the next lecture. Have a great day.